I, I want to uh, welcome everybody here in the audience uh, at the Iowa City Public Library, as well as those of you who are watching this evening's lecture, which is live streamed by the library on their YouTube channel. Um, special appreciation goes to our co-sponsors, the Iowa City Public Library, both for the space and for the audiovisual support. Um, Delta Sigma Theta, thank you. Are there, yes. <laughs> The Iowa City Education Association. Any members here? Of course we are. <laughs> OK. And the Iowa State Education Association. Same thing, almost. And then TRAIL, which is Tools and Resources for Active Independent Living for Senior Residents. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Grace King, who is a Gazette reporter who recently co-authored a report in the Gazette about Governor Reynolds' proposal to upend Iowa's AEAs. And I think there'll be some questions this evening about the proposals uh, to modify AEAs. I also want to recognize that we have some elected officials here in the room. We have Eleanor Levine, our, one of our state representatives, who is also a League of Women Voters member, and Charlie Eastman, who is a school board member. Is there anybody else that I haven't recognized or? Okay. Um, our speaker this evening, and we're very fortunate to have him, is Chase Ramey, the Deputy Superintendent of the Iowa City Community School District. He first joined the school district in 2012 as the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. Four years later, he moved to Fairfax, Virginia, where he also served as the Human Resources Assistant Superintendent. Like many of us, he came back to Iowa in 2018, and um, this time as the chief operating officer at the school district, and was promoted to the deputy superintendent in the spring of 2021. Dr. Ramey heralds from Kansas City, Missouri, and began his career, which I think is very interesting, he began his career in education as an elected school board member in the North Kansas City School District. I'm sure that gave you a very interesting perspective from the start <laughs> on public education. He's a graduate of the University of Iowa's College of Law and holds a PhD in educational leadership from the University of Iowa College of Education. In fact, the reason we needed to um, move this back to a 7 p.m. start time was because he was over teaching graduate students in the leadership education program. So I'm very honored that you could come tonight. Very much appreciate your willingness to present. And looking forward to hearing what the, you have to say about the challenges and changes for public schools as a result of House File 68. And also your other thoughts about public education in general. So Dr. Ray. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for being here. And I'd also uh, extend my appreciation to uh, Director Eastham, who I work with uh, closely at the, at the school, uh, uh, for being here, and Representative Levine, who is a good partner to us at the school district. Um, when the league originally reached out to us to come and talk, I said, well, put together maybe 60 or 70 minutes uh, of a lecture and then uh, open up for questions. There will not be 60 or 70 minutes <laughs> worth uh, of lecture. Um, I know you have lots of, of questions, and, and really just I appreciate you being here and showing your interest in education. And so I'd rather spend our time this evening really answering the questions that you have and, and helping ensure that you have the right information or perspective that we have from the school district and as you kind of are movers and shakers in our, in our community. And so I will offer some opening thoughts, but uh, more likely than not, um, I, I am happy to answer questions that you have. And I'll try to keep my um, answers not long-winded. Um, but uh, sometimes I can get on a roll as uh, that can happen. Also, I should point out one of our great administrators is sitting in the back of the room, uh, Debbie Bennett. So um, I tell you what, yes, of course, our, our principals do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Um, so I am not unique in this work in that I wear more than one hat like most of us. Uh, Susan so talked about my professional um, standing, that I was also a school member. 
but I'm also a parent. Um, I have three children that are here in the Iowa City area. Two of them um, attend Lemmy Elementary. Our third is not old enough yet. And so uh, like uh, a lot of us, right, we come to some of these issues and we have sometimes a professional perception and we have a personal perception and we have other factors that really influence our, our take on them. And so it's not lost on me that uh, we have a different lens on some of these topics that we talk about. And it has nothing to do with the legislation that we're going to talk about tonight, but one of the things that really helps me with that is I don't think we're going to talk about tonight, at least it's not on the agenda so far this spring, is um, for those that have kids or live near our schools, you know that um, our transportation circles for our buildings, right? You have to live with that out with outside of two miles to get a bus at the elementary level and outside three miles to get a bus at the, at the secondary level. My daughter's a kindergartner. She's five years old. We live 1.99 miles <laughs> from Lemmy Elementary School, right? And so... When I have my deputy superintendent hat on, I try to explain to our families the rules and regulations that we abide by and, and what we have to impose. But at the same time, I have my parent hat on, right? And I, and I realize the challenges that some of these things face. And I mean, I'm not going to let my five-year-old walk 1.99 miles to let, me, to let me elementary school. And so those are real issues. But I also understand that all of the issues don't impact our families the same way based on maybe where we live or our standing in the community. And so we always have to look at things through a variety of different perspectives. And so as we talk tonight, I'll try to provide those answers and look at them from a number of the different angles that we consider or what we're talking about. And um, I want to be as transparent and as open and as forthcoming with my answers as possible. But um, I pointed out a couple of our elected officials, um, A, because that's the polite thing to do, but B, also we sit in different seats. And Director Eastham is a fierce advocate for everyone in our school district. And I believe that I'm a fierce advocate for our students as well. But because of the different seats we sit in, Charlie being an elected official and me being an employee, that also impacts what, uh, what, we, can, what we can say, right? As an employee, and as Charlie is a board member, we're here to serve all students. But the way that we have to roll that out sometimes changes. And so sometimes you might be looking for an answer from me that has maybe more of a political bent uh, towards the issue or not. And it's not that I'm sidestepping that, but that as an employee, one of my main responsibilities as a deputy superintendent and a leader in an organization is to make sure that we interpret the laws in a way that allows us to provide a safe, supportive, and welcoming environment for all of our students and ensures that our employees feel supported and they know the rules of the game. We talk about legislation. That's one thing that I always talk about with our administrators, and I see Debbie shaking her head. She's heard me give uh, a summary of this lecture at the beginning of the year because I don't believe that our legislation, especially when it comes to ed leadership, whether we agree with it or not, is something to be feared. It is something that we have to try to understand because we're entrusted with the community's most valuable assets, our kids. And so if we spend all of our time trying to talk about why something is unfair or why we disagree with it, as an employee, I'm doing a disservice to those students that I serve. And so I offer that because my role in my view tonight might be a little different than if Representative Levine was answering or if Charlie was, was answering because I bring, maybe, yeah, sure, right? I just bring that different perspective because of how we want to make sure that no matter how maybe we feel personally about the legislation, about how that impacts what we're trying to do as educators. With that said, like I said, Grace, here or not here, I'll be as transparent and as forthright as I can and answer the questions that you have. Um, and it is an interesting time in, in education. Um, I think that what we've seen, really, even as we come out of COVID and maybe a little bit further back than that, is we've seen politics being played further and further into education. 
um, even candidates running on a specific ticket. When I was on the school board in North Kansas City, that's something that, that didn't happen. Um, education wasn't red or blue. It was simply for students. And what we're now seeing is that education in our schools are sometimes becoming laboratories, battlegrounds for some of these things that are being played out on a larger scale being tested in our school environments. And you don't have to sit on one side of the political spectrum or not to, to think that. We just know that. We've seen it in the data. We've seen that in the way school board election races are run, the way votes are coming down, that it's becoming more and more political. Now, is that good or bad? I don't know. I, I think that's for each individual to decide. And that goes back to the comment I made. Our job and our challenge is to navigate that new political influence on education to make sure that we continue to provide the best environment we can for our students. When we look at um, Iowa specifically, and I don't want to give a history lesson, right? I'm just trying to get a framework of, of, uh, of, of where we are and then answer some questions is, and this is what I shared in the class, is you can't look at one year in a vacuum. We have to look at a number of different years and how things cascade onto each other. You could look back at 2021 and how the legislation we saw around freedom of speech in House File 744 and the um, legislation around how we, how we teach about race, how we do professional development in House File 802. And so it's not enough to look at just what's pending right now with the AEAs. I think we have to take a large, larger view of where we've been and where we're going. And it feeds into this idea about it becoming more and more political. I would also argue that it actually goes back a little bit uh, longer ago than that, all the way back to 2018, um, the year I came back. Anyone, Q and I, I'm going to let you ask most of the questions, but I am a, a teacher, so I like to ask questions too, right? Check for understanding. 2018, Representative Levine, you cannot answer this. What happened that changed a little? Another can my friends from the ICEA or SEA, I'm giving the answer away. What happened back in 2018 that was really kind of a shakeup for education here in the state? Collective bargaining. That's right, right. The, um, the legislature decided to take a different approach to collective bargaining. And so Chapter 20, which is the uh, part of our code that oversees that, was, was modified extensively. And all the elements, especially as it relates to educators, were taken out of that code section except our need to bargain base wages. And that's an important piece, at least for me, because I believe that a lot of what we do in education is relationship-based. Teacher to the student, student to the principal, principal to the families, on and up, superintendent to the board, board to the community. And when that happened, it made us redefine how we looked at the relationships with our key asset, which is our, is our teachers. And it began to see some of that political influence starting to creep in on what we're doing with education. And so that's where really I kind of look at where we saw some things start to change and see a lot of that political influence is what happened in chapter 20. Now again, right? You're gonna be like, Chase, get off the fence. But I'm gonna sit on the fence a lot uh, tonight. You can look at it different ways. I've been in I've been in states where they've had collective bargaining, and I've been in states where it's been a right to work, and I've worked in education systems in both. Personally, I like collective bargaining because I'm a rule follower, and I think collective bargaining allows you to establish the rules and clarity and knowing what we're doing lets us all know where we are, where we need to be, and where we need to go. And so as there's more change to legislation, it makes some of those things a little bit murky. And, and it forces us to really stay on top of, of what we're talking about. So you have 2018, you have 2021 with the 744 with free speech, 802 along with how we can teach about race in, in our schools. And the next year we have um, House, excuse me, there's a lot and I'm not that great. I can't remember everything. I've got to get my notes. I was going to try to do some of this. Um, in 2022, 
we had the progression. And the, one of the things that, that came out that we, we started to see kind of a move from more of that um, into a delve into some of the social happenings in our schools from 21 to 22 is the idea of um, athletics for our student athletes. And um, it was the bill that went into effect that the governor signed into law that said that especially um, on our teams for females, that only students that were assigned uh, a gender of female at birth could play on our female teams. And coming out of that session, um, we had people on in our ears from both the Democrat side saying this is only the beginning. There's going to be more of this push to legislate social issues. And we had folks on the right telling us about, you know, this is great. This is, this is what we need for um, our female athletes. What do we do? We have to follow the law, right? Again, that's what our job is as a school district, it is not to necessarily step in and say, even if we don't agree with it, we're not going to follow it. We have to follow the laws, but at the same time, try to create environments that are the most supportive, most welcoming for all of our students. And that's a theme that, that we've seen and that we've tried to tackle with the challenges. As new laws come down, it's continuing to do that. Okay, how do we make sure that our students feel welcomed? How do we make sure that they feel supported? How do they make sure that they feel safe in those educational environments? And every spring, sometimes that gets redefined. So that's 2022, 2023 comes along and Literally, in the middle of the night, um, the bathroom law goes into effect. Participation again. What's the, what's the bathroom law from anybody in the audience? Okay, this gives me a good idea, right? I don't want to say things that you know about, so I don't want to, I don't want to insult anybody's knowledge. So a law in effect in the spring of 2023 that... Um, that required K-12 restrooms, excuse me, K-12 schools to designate our multi-use restrooms as either for boys or for girls. We couldn't have any gender neutral restrooms in our schools anymore. Yes, we could make accommodations for students that wanted to use a gender neutral restroom, but in a district like Iowa City, where we had been following a national trend to move to more gender neutral restrooms, for a law to be signed basically almost at midnight and to come into effect the next day, it's really challenging. Um, regardless of if we agree with the law or not, to have no runway to implement those changes is really difficult. And not only to implement those changes from an operational standpoint, but you heard me talk about the environment we want to provide for students. We also have no room, runway to talk to our students. Right? We want our students to feel welcomed. We want them to feel supported. The way we do that is we talk to them about what's going on. And when something happens to us suddenly, we lose that ability to have that conversation with our kiddos to help, have, help them understand the environment. And we might not have the why behind it, right? but at least say, hey, you're still welcome here. We care about you. We want to support you. But these are the new rules of the game that, that we have to abide by. And we can do that conversation as delicately as possible, and it's still really difficult, right? Um, and so we always try to take that approach of understanding that we don't walk in other people's shoes. And as much as we try to support and provide that information in a way that we believe supportive, we're not going to know exactly how something is impacting someone else. And then the big uh, law that came down last year was Senate File 496. Um, and of course, if you've been following that along, uh, most recently uh, there was an injunction handed down by a federal judge that really put a number of those pieces of that law um, on ice that we don't have to um, enforce them. And there are a number of pieces of it, so if I forget one, I'm not trying to discount it, so I, I apologize, right? But um, a number of different components. A, a big one that a lot of people have heard about especially since we're sitting in the library, right? Yeah, I mean, trust me, I would not forget that one since we're sitting here in the library, is a restriction on the books that we had to develop libraries that were age appropriate and that any books that def uh, depicted or described 
um, a sex act as defined by Iowa law had to be taken out of the library. That was one of those pieces of, of legislation. Along with that, we had to do the same in our classroom libraries, that those books could not be there either. Um, I talked about the laws in the previous sessions that had um, a focus on our LGBTQ plus students. 496 had that as well. Um, said we were not allowed to teach, have curriculum, um, provide support for or advocate for LGBTQ plus issues at the, elementary, uh, at the elementary level. Also, if a student want, wants a, a gender affirming accommodation, we have to tell parents. Um, and that we cannot provide parents any information on any issue, not just gender identity, that would in any way be, be misleading. And another couple other pieces of that that are, are less talked about was there's some new language around surveys and about that we can't survey um, uh, students about physical, emotional, or mental well-being without parent permission. Um, now, like putting my putting my ops hat on, right? Like when you look at some of those other things that we just talked about, that, that seems kind of low stakes compared to like the impact some of the other pieces. But from an operational standpoint, from an organizational standpoint, that's really that's a really big lift, right? You have fifteen thousand students, and so to to think about having to do that legwork on the front end creates a operational challenge that we never talk about because that's not our priority, right? Operations is something we do behind the scenes to support students, so we're not going to go out and say that just <laughs> that that that's going to take a lot of work, right? Like we focus on the pieces that we know are going to impact kids. But there's also these other pieces that create some challenges on, on the backside that, that are also difficult for us. And then fast forward to this winter, um, right before winter break, um, the judge heard that the, the injunction and then coming out of winter break, so just the beginning of January, an injunction was put in place. And so a couple of those components, mainly the one around the library books and the curriculum that we could not teach at the elementary um, were enjoined, and so we do not have to follow those. One of the misinformation pieces on that is that the entire law was not um, put on hold, just certain pieces. So the parent information piece, both on if a student were to request an accommodation, as well as the survey piece, they remain in effect. And so, again, the rules change, the rules migrate, and we continue to try to navigate a path forward. And right, it's an injunction. Um, I do have a law degree, but I am not a lawyer. I am not the district's lawyer. Um, it, but right, that means it's temporary. And so what, yeah, right, you don't know when it's gonna happen, right? And so we're in this state of limbo as we wait for a new round of legislation or for a decision to be made by the Eighth Circuit Court Again, as this whole time, we can try to maintain business as normal for our students, support them, welcome them, and help them learn and grow in our school. I promise, I'm almost done, and we'll answer your questions. And then we turn the page to this year. And in all honesty, this is, the, this is the part that I have the least information about. I know that's what you want me to talk about a little bit, is what's happening this year. But it's still all in draft form. Um, and. Um, the, the bill came down about the AEA and about the changes of our area education agencies. For those who are not familiar with the education system, we have our Department of Education at the state level. Our AEAs are these regional offices that help provide a broad array of supports, a lot in the area of special ed, some media services, some instructional supports. And um, it, really, it really is dependent on how large your district is about how dedicated some of those supports are for you or how um, much your district depends on them. So, and I should have said this earlier, right? Legislation doesn't impact every district the same way. Um, it's fair to say that some of the pieces that we've talked about probably land in Iowa City differently than they land in other parts of the state. And the legislation that's in the pipeline this year does that same thing too. So this AEA bill about these support services, the impact and how that's felt 
could be different in a place like a Cedar Rapids or an Iowa City as opposed to in a Lone Tree or in a West Branch because of the just the scale, right, of an, of an organization. We have 1,500 special education students there about in the Iowa City Community School District. That's more students than a number of the surrounding school districts have in total. And so our ability to have resources that um, we have available to us for those purposes is different. Um, that's still, that bill is still being finalized, and so I think there's some movement, so we're yet to see how that one is going to, to pan out. I do need to go back to one from last year. I apologize. I think it's the one you wanted me to talk about. Uh, now that I remember, the vouchers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I almost made it. I should have just been like, and I'm, see you later. Uh, gosh, darn it. I should have just kept going. Um, yeah, you guys probably would have stopped me. Um, the, um, along with the AA bill is a proposal to increase um, teacher salaries. I hope we can all agree that our teachers deserve to be paid more, and um, it's just a matter of how do we do that, Setting, uh, raising the starting salary for teachers to $50,000, and then making sure that teachers make at least $62,000 by their 12th year. Again, it's impact, it's scale. In, um, I know this isn't a finance lecture, but what we would consider a kind of a property-rich district like Iowa City that has a very, very supportive um, voter base that supports the levies, supports the bond initiatives that we put forward. Um, that is probably not as heavy of a lift, especially given where our salary scales are, as to some of the other school districts that don't have the property, the tax base that we do. And then how do you sustain that? And so more money for teachers. I, I think that's a good thing. It's a matter of how do you get that and then be able to sustain that. And so I'll go back and talk about vouchers, and then I'll, and then I'll pause and, and, and open it for, for questions. And really, that was the other. Sorry, I can't believe I forgot that. Um, Cinefile, Cinefile 92, the education savings accounts, was the other large piece that came down last year. And, um, you know, it's, there is no, in my opinion, and some others might have different, a one-size-fits-all answer for, for any of these. Um, and so, again, the impact on vouchers is going to be different um, based on where you are or what district you're in. But there are um, some um, um, see-through themes from, from year to year. I mentioned a lot about the uh, parent notification pieces of 496. The voucher bill is also about parental choice, parental oversight. And so you see that theme playing through about maybe what might be some of the motivating factors outside or inside of Des Moines in, in pushing those forward. So the voucher bill. For the, the details of, of folks that maybe aren't as familiar, a three-year implementation, and seriously, if I misspeak, do step in, because I mean, in all honesty, right? Like, we're all in this, we're all, we're all in this together, and um, the plan is a, is a three-year implementation, and the qualification for how much a family can make to qualify for the savings account increases every year to the third year where then it's open to all Iowans. There are some caveats in there as well, like last year, um, if you weren't currently attending a private school, you still qualified even if you were beyond the income thresholds or if you had an incoming kindergartner. So like I had an incoming kindergartner last year, we could have qualified. I did not apply, so let's not, let's not write that down, that the deputy superintendent applied for one. Um, so there were a couple of those pieces along, and it, and it gives access to about $7,600. That Then there are some rules that I won't go into those details that a family can use to attend a school of their choice, a, um, a private school, whether that's parochial or not. The kickback to the district is that we get about $1,200 um, per student for um, any students that, that, um, that would take a voucher and go to a school. To, to localize it this year, um, we have roughly 470 students that reside in the district that are participating in the Ed Savings Account plan. Now, the majority of those already went to a private school, um, and so they were already somewhere other than an ICCSD school. But we had roughly um, 
just over 100, about 110 students that were enrolled full time in our district last year that took advantage of the Ed Savings Account and went to a, a private school. Now, if you check my math, it's not going to work out directly what I gave because there's other factors we, we look into, but we calculate that roughly that's a loss in revenue to the district of about $900,000 for next year, given the money that they have for the Ed Savings Accounts and how we look at kind of how we roll up our enrollment every year. So if the Ed Savings Accounts hadn't gone into place, we'd have another $900,000 coming in to the district. It's not the legislation we're talking about uh, tonight, but money's always tight. You've probably seen some messages from the superintendent about where we are with our budget. And so $900,000, that's real money. Um, and our ability to, to, to serve students. And so, again, it is what it is, right? It, 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 they're there, and so then we figure out a way to continue to work with the families that we serve and also understanding the impacts that, that those have on us. That's a lot of talking and I have more information than opinion, um, but I'd love to make sure that I cover the things that you all want me to talk about or talk more in specific areas. And so I'll pause there and open it up for questions that you all might have. Hi, I was reading up on it, and um, I was wondering if they said that categorical supplement funding weighing will change the weight of everything. Has it been indicated what budget lines, what supplemental, okay. Yeah. And if that is going to be part of it, would each district be able to choose the weight of the supplemental Budget, weight, did I say that correctly? Yeah. I, I understand yeah. your question. Yeah. I, 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 don't know the, I don't okay. know the answer. We've seen a couple of different proposals put forward about how they would disaggregate districts like based on enrollment and then maybe yeah. what that entitles. But it's still kind of such early days that um, we, don't. We, we don't know how that's going to roll out. With the federal budget, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of crazy right now. <laughs> um, is that going to be taken into consideration too on a yearly basis? I mean, there's a cap. I mean, how much federal funding do yeah. we receive for state education? Sure. Um, so in a general sense, Districts usually get somewhere between 7 and 12%, depending on their special ed population. Title funds are made up of federal dollars, and the states do it differently. Um, so it's hard to predict. Um, it fluctuates a little bit, but in terms of your question, no, we haven't had conversations concerned about the federal dollars. Um, even when they haven't met their budget decisions and the, and the federal government has shut down for a brief period of time, um, we've not really, that's not really been a um, big component of our conversations. You know, this came up a, a while ago, um, back in the No Child Left Behind days, because there was this idea that, you know, No Child Left Behind was a federal law, and you really only have to abide by it if you take federal dollars. So can districts survive without taking federal dollars? And... Um, Again, it's a lot of money, and, and so that kind of went, some districts tried it, even a couple states, but they finally quickly realized it, it wasn't a long-term solution. But no, that really, that, that piece hasn't come up. Now, where the federal dollars have come up in the conversation, and this is what we're still trying to get some clarity on, and again, it's just clarity to figure it out as we talk about the changes to the AEA bill this year. Um, the way it works is the district sends our local, our area local education agencies what we call flow-through dollars. So we don't really see them. They just flow through our system. And our understanding is a portion of those are some federal dollars. And so as we talk about what our options are, there's still not a lot of clarity about what is the amount of those flow-through dollars if this happens, do all those dollars come back to the local district? Do the federal dollars go somewhere else? 
And so we're still just trying to get a, a full picture of, of what that looks like. Yeah, you're fine. So um, children. Would you mind standing and stay here? Oh, OK. Alana, <laughs> I have two kids in the district okay. who are in the special education department, and I am a teacher in the district. You are? So, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to tell me. Now. You don't have to tell me now, but you can tell me. I'm after. a librarian too, so. Okay. <laughs> School librarian. <laughs> so I know. I'm I'm glad right. I have it. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. Like, real calm. Right. Regardless, right. <laughs> um, if you have a child with a disability, they have Medicaid for children with special needs. It's called, and you are able in the IEP to mark off, we will reimburse the schools for all the services that you provide for us. So of course I do it. A lot of people are unaware of it, but with that being said, can they touch that money? If I am going to a public school and I mark off that my child's Medicaid could go to the school, Will they be able to touch that? So first, thank you. I didn't know that you were, I apologize, I didn't recognize you as a librarian, so thanks for <laughs> what you do for our schools. I mean, no, and, and, and you, and I'll honestly, you could talk here, like you know, it's been, a, it's been a, a challenging, interesting fall, and you all have had a very tough job, and you've been on the front lines of it, so I really do appreciate everything you and your colleagues have done, so thank you so much for that part. Uh, I sincerely mean that. Um, and in terms of your question, I don't know. I don't know. And, and I'm not embarrassed or afraid to say that. There's just some things we don't know and we're still trying to get clarity on. But I will tuck that question away because if you have it, other people have it. And maybe they haven't thought about that at the state level either. And so um, that's something we'd want to, um, that I can talk with our special ed team about. I'm wondering if Iowa City School District is going to stand strong against Kim Reynolds and her desire to dump the AEA or damage it. Charlie? <laughs> um, I was an AEA for 26 years. It's a great, great organization. It is. I know you guys know it. it is. The AEAs are, the AERs are, are good organizations, and we've got great partnerships, great partnerships there. Um, you know, like I said, um, as the deputy superintendent and as an as the deputy superintendent, as an employee, um, you know, we give the information to our board, and our board does our political advocacy for us. And I'm not going to put Charlie on the spot here because he's one of seven, not not the entire entire board. But um, we're going to provide Charlie and the people of the state all the information we can, so we can make a better decision for that. But, um, you know, like I said, we don't even know what that, what that bill, if it does end up being voted on the final form, is going to, is going to look like. No, of course not, Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Uh, please. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Eastam here, a member of the school board. Uh, I try to answer in a couple of ways. One, I personally am not going to approve anything that the governor sends to me. <laughs> sends to me that is in any, in any form that she's chosen already in regard to the AENA and a lot of other issues. Uh, I would also say that uh, although single board members do not speak for the board, I can report that at our last uh, legislative forum session held last Friday, uh, which school board uh, and the district invites legislators all over the, uh, from, from the local area uh, to come and talk to us. Uh, the the uh, AEA proposals were discussed, and I, I don't know of any other school board member that I heard that supports what the governor is proposing in, in any form at all. And we conveyed that, I think we conveyed that fairly well to the legislative uh, delegation. I'm Nancy Porter, and uh, I uh, string along a lot with the Iowa State Education Association as a retired teacher. But I, I love the way you were able to have a count 
as to exactly the financial disability that was a result of the vouchers. I mean, you know those numbers. You know where those children went, probably. Um, I wonder, one, if you have gotten the $1,200 rebate for each one of those students. Mm -hmm. And I also wonder um, if you know that statewide we're having a terrible time getting those numbers. Each school district knows. Why do you suppose it's so hard to get the statistics that go with that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know that's that, again that that's I that's an, that's a question I don't know the answer to. Um, I just didn't come prepared to talk about you know what our billing is, and so I couldn't even tell you that if we do or don't have that. Yes, we've calculated it. I mean, we have a budget cycle that we work with in terms of when we're reimbursed from the state. You know, we know for one piece, right, that I said for next year because those that aren't as familiar with the way it works is our budget for the following year is based on kiddos in our schools on September 30. So we call September 30, October 1, the count date. And this reminds me of another piece of legislation I didn't talk about from last year. Um, is So however many kids we have in the district on that date is then what is our funding for, for the following year. And so the cycle you know, is, is over a year um, long is the way they, they look at that. So it really makes those students that are in our school on that date of critical importance to, to do what we do. Now, to that flexibility for parents and ensure that parents have the choice of where they send their students. One of the pieces of legislation that came out um, last year was open enrollment that um, lifted the restriction of when students could transfer to school districts. And so it allows families to move between schools or school districts at any time throughout the year. Yes, there are some guidelines that they have to abide to, but again, it becomes a challenge. Uh, when we talk about those dollars and how we fund, right, and our largest asset, our most important adult asset, our teachers, um, you know, our teachers and our staff account for 85% of our budget. And so when you're spending that much on your personnel and almost all of your money to support that comes from your enrollment, Having those numbers and knowing what they are is critically important, so we do keep a close eye on it. Um, but we have faith that we're going to get those, get those dollars, and, and we don't think they're going to be withheld in, in terms of knowing that and, and when they're going to come. But I just don't know the, um, the pay cycle on it. Chase, <clears throat> Susan Ansel here. Um, I'm wondering, has there been any revolving door of people who went with their vouchers to private schools and it hasn't worked out and they've returned to the school district. The implications both for the school district and also for the student. Yeah, um, it's still pretty early and we haven't run that report. And again, our, we're just, we're pretty, we're pretty big. And so to, to look at those um, enrollments, and so I would have. I could, we can. That's an interesting stat, and something that we should look at in terms of how we have people to take advantage of their vouchers and, and come back. I think it's probably too early to to tell yet. Um, that um, we'll have better data on that this year, next year. You know, I mean, like I told you, I won't give a lot of opinions on legislation, but I will give you my opinion of the school district, and I think we offer the best education in the state. And um, I'm proud of what we do, and I'm proud of our school district. And so, you know, when we talk about the best way to, um, to prevent people from leaving the district is by offering a top-notch education program. And I believe that we do that. It's through support of our board. It's through hiring great people. It's by having advocates at the state. And it's having a community that provides us the support that we need. And so when we look at that, there are districts, and this goes to that disproportionality. There are districts around our state that are struggling, and you know, we are in it for all educators, and so we want public schools to be at their very best. But here in Iowa City, the best choice for families is to come to Iowa City, because we believe we provide the premier education for our students in our area. 
And, you know, that's okay if families make a different decision. Uh, we'll still work with them. But, you know, as we talk about the voucher bill and, pe- and families having that choice, that's great that families have that choice. We're just going to make sure they still cho- choose to come to Iowa City Schools. One of our legislators. <laughs> Um, Eleanor Lynn, I have one question about the AEA bill, um, which is one of, I was a Grant Wood AEA employee the first three years out of college because I was a substitute teacher. So um, looking at the specific effect, some of these programs that people don't even realize that are run by the AEA, um, so like, what is, has ICCSD even started with the conversation of like, how we're going to do things like printing if the ACAEA goes, materials printing and sure. um, substitute services management and things like that. <clears throat> so that goes, again, to the, to the scale. I mean, we, and that, that shows some of the stark differences between some of the school districts. Like, we, we run our substitute services out of our own HR office. And so that provides us um, an advantage a lot of the other districts don't have because we don't have to utilize their system. And so um, we utilize some of the media services like the printing, but other ones we we handle on our own. And so for us, um, I mentioned earlier, our special education population being over 10%, being over 1,500 students. So that's really where um, we're, we're focused in on is if those services are to change or to be depleted, how will we make sure that we continue to provide the services to our special ed students come to expect in Iowa City, because it's important for us to not see a lag or a step backwards in how we serve those students. But that's really where our primary, we, and I'm, I'm not going to shortchange any of their services. Um, we get some instructional educational services around our compliance with um, our ESSA plans and, and things like that. But the bulk of our ser- resources from the AEA are related to our special education services. And I, and I, and I don't know it for other for other districts, um, but I think everybody's having those conversations. Yeah. You might end up getting calls from folks who want to make a. Right. Collective. Well, and Charlie mentioned it, right? And, and the head of the Grantwood AEA came to our meeting last week, and he gave the example of a speech pathologist, which is something that our AEAs provide. A school district like Iowa City, with thirty sites, nineteen elementaries we could, in theory, hire a speech pathologist or hire multiple speech pathologists and share them around our buildings. But if you are um, a Lone Tree, for example, um, or a a Mount Pleasant or somewhere else where you don't need a full 1.0 speech pathologist, you only need a portion of that. You're not going to be able to go out and hire a portion of that. Um, Or you're going to have to do it at a cost that's going to really be detrimental to your budget. That's where one of the beauties of the conglomerate that is the AEA comes into play because they're able to provide those services to a number of districts in a way that helps maximize those resources, which is good for everybody. Good for the students, good for the district, good for the state, because we're getting the most out of those resources that we have. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, AEA is remarkable. Um, Just to let you know, a lot of parents who have kids with cognitive and intellectual disabilities do extensive research and come here specifically because of the school district's support and Iowa City's support of persons who are neurodiverse. But um, would they take the services away of evaluation, OT, PT, assistive technology? You don't know. We, we don't know. No. But what I do know, and you talk about uh, the AAs being great, is we have seen um, the governor's office and, and Representative Levine, you can help me out here, um, have been, I, I think, responsive to some of the outpouring of support they've heard about the AAs, right? Okay. We, we've seen them say, we're going to look at doing things a little bit differently. A week is, uh, eight days ago, we were told there will be a new version of the bill. Yeah. 
So that's why there's a lot of, we don't know. They put out an initial bill. There was a lot of reaction, a lot of support for the AAAs. And they said, okay, maybe we need to relook at this a little bit. And so that's still happening. And we just haven't seen what the next version that's going to look like. The, the thing we have heard is they're going to split out the AA piece from the teacher pay piece. I don't know if that's happened yet either. <laughs> right. But what, what do you mean? What AA so they, it was actually, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I can never say this word, ominous. Uh, omnibus bill, and so, yeah, an omnibus. <laughs> and so it had multiple things, and I think one of the original pieces of feedback, and it might have been from um, the IS, ISEA, um, was this idea of do we need to split those apart, and so that's one of their pieces, that not only will the bill be revised, but they will split it into two bills. Now, again, that's what we're being told by advocates at the state level, so will that happen or not? But that's our understanding, is that it will um, probably be two, two bills. And the session's still young, right? So it could be more. This is Judith Kanabi speaking again, sorry. Sure, you're right. But um, one of the things that disturbs me, and you said something that reminded me of what I hear people saying in articles. Well, the school districts can hire their own people. But, for example, I just had a parent although I've been retired for many, many years, call me and say, I have a child that has, they say has autism, but I don't believe it. And what am I going to do about that? So who do I call? AEA. Mm -hmm. And there is a brilliant autism specialist who runs the autism program there. And Kelly is great. And so she guided me on this, and I've been following up with this parent. And you cannot hire enough people to take all the all the various things that, that AEA provides. And certainly small districts can't, but big, Iowa City can't either. I'm sure they can hire a speech pathologist. We're good. But you also have all kinds of other things. So just what you were saying. So, thanks. And you're a good speaker, by the way. Oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. And I see a hand up. So... This is the greatest school district in the state. There is, and let me, and I said that, and yeah, I, some bias because I work here. It is one of the premier ones, yeah. right? We, there are lots of great school districts. I sure. think Iowa overall, but I mean, I'm from here, right? We're all, you know, we, yeah. we, all, yeah. we all love where we are. Yeah. That's why we live so, here. So being among the best, and I would say the best, but being among the best, um, from a teacher staffing standpoint, are you fully staffed? You know, it's like you're reading my mind because Judy, Judith made a comment. And I was like, we should talk about this. And you brought it up. Um, we are from a teacher standpoint on the support side um, where we, we have vacancies and we struggle. I was talking with our nutrition director today. We're about 10 percent short in nutrition services. And so we look to um, we look to always address that. You know, we've tried to follow suit with the city about what is a livable wage for our support staff employees. We talk a lot about teachers. And I grew up on, you heard I was an HR person, I grew up on the ops side of the house, so I get real Papa Bear when we start talking about our ops people just because I think they're so important to how we make the system go. And so we look at the wages for those folks as well, so looking increases on that side. Um, because we would call what we call a, we refer to it as a destination district yeah. um, in the state of Iowa because of what the community has to offer. I think a large part of our success as a school system is because of our community. So we're pretty lucky. Um, we continue to have high applicant pools for our positions. It can be a struggle. But yes, we have been fully staffed at the beginning of the year, um, every year, and continue to be fully staffed on the teacher side. If we have a vacancy, it's because somebody left. Um, we do see more and more um, hard to fill positions, especially as we extend our offerings and look at more career and tech ed programmings. Um, but um, we continue to attract talent at, at a rate that um, is higher than a lot of other districts. Now, overall, education is, is, is having their teacher workforce depleted. Um, over the last 10 years, we've seen a drop in over 30% of applicants to teacher prep programs. Uh, about half or even slightly more than half of our new teachers leave the profession 
in the first five years. And so there are these compounding factors that uh, are making teaching a profession that people just are shying away from um, in ways they haven't in the past. But um, yes, I would tell you that we're an anomaly. Uh, as I talk to my colleagues around the state, we don't have some of the staffing challenges that, that some of our, uh, our other districts do, at least on the, on the teacher side. We're always looking for support staff. Good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I was wondering, as a result of the injunction and the things that <clears throat> are just kind of on hold right mm -hmm. now, um, it seems like there was a long list of books that were going to be withheld from the libraries. So are they not being withheld now, or are they in limbo also? I mean, what's, what's happened to that list? Sure. No, um, we have, uh, we've returned or are returning all the books to the shelves in, okay. in our libraries. So. That's good yeah. news. That it is. is. News. It is, yes. That would be accurate, right? Yeah, we return the book? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Donna Hurst, uh, what's the district doing to address retention of teachers of color? Um, that's a that's a good it's a good question and it is something that has continued to be a focal point for us in the work that uh, that we've done. Um, we're employing a number of different strategies when it comes to retention, looking at changes to our mentor program that are specifically designed to uh, provide um, supports for our, um, our teachers of color, trying to work with them to identify career paths forward or specific locations or jobs that they believe that are ones that um, would fit with what their personal vision, mission, skill set is. Um, we have created what we call our Grow Your Own programs that are designed to create those leadership paths forward for um, all of our employees that want them, but really have a focus on our employees of color to not only retain them, but also to grow them and to take on different roles inside our organization. And then also, um, you know, when I think of retention, Retention, recruitment, hiring, that's something that's very specific to any organization, a school system or any business. But when we're talking about retention, retention has to be more about than just the work you do. It has to be also about where you live and your investment in the community. So finding ways to um, connect our employees with um, services or organizations of interest inside our community as well, so that they don't just want to work here; they want to they want to stay here. They want to live here too. Um, it's something that we're always constantly trying to keep front of mind, and is a focus for the work that we do. Ideally, our workforce would be reflective of the students we serve. Right, our students should see people that look like them leading classrooms and leading buildings. We're not there. I'm not going to pretend that we are. And so it is something that, that we strive for, that, that we have lots of conversation about, and we can try to continue to try to move forward in that work. How many languages are spoken? <sighs> um, over, let's last count. Um, how many languages? Um, over 90 different over languages. Question. What? How many languages are spoken? And I don't have, over 75? Sure. Sure. Somewhere between 75 and it's, it's, <laughs> it's high. Um, 75, 80, somewhere um, up there. We send out all of our publications in five languages, our top five. And then we employ a number of different uh, translations, interpretation services. But um, yes, over, well over 70 different languages spoken. Um, in the homes of our of our students. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> recently uh, returned here after being uh, away for fifty some years or so, and I lived in a lot of different places. But uh, there's, uh, and I'm interested in all these issues because I had, uh, among other things, I had taught for 
uh, for a couple years far away from here. But uh, one of the questions that, uh, uh, that I, I would be most concerned about would be the, uh, w where the requirements that, uh, that parents would have to be notified of everything. Uh, because uh, uh, from, <clears throat> from my own experience, I know that uh, students sometimes rely on teachers, there are <clears throat> bonds between teachers, and, and uh, if, if they feel they can't trust parents, they uh, confide in a teacher, and then uh, that, the, the rug is pulled out from under them, well, uh, that would probably give them a pretty negative attitude. Uh, so, so that's the question I'm wondering about. If if the teacher gets any uh, any kind of support for for not reporting to the parents what they're supposedly required to under the law. Sure, um, and uh, student safety, student well-being, that sense of belonging, are definitely things that are very important to us. And so we've had those same internal conversations about what does that look like and how do we make sure that students are aware of what our obligations are under the law, and then how do we try to, to navigate that. And one of the things that we've talked to our, our staff about is we feel it's important that they have those conversations with the student. And so that um, in the example you gave where that a, that a teacher felt they were required to share something with a parent, for instance, the, the child's been asked to call be called by a different nickname um, you know they have to make that request and say that they want to be called by a nickname different than their name and and what we've tried what we've not tried what we've told our teachers and our administrators and worked with is it's okay to have a conversation with that student to make sure they understand what happens next to say you know this isn't something I want to do but I'm required by law to tell your parents that you're requesting us to call you by a different name or by different pronouns. And to give the student that opportunity to engage in a dialogue with the teacher about whether or not they want to go forward with that. Now, if they say they don't want to, that clearly probably sets up some different conversations and potentially different challenges that that student is going to feel about their ability to do that. But to the point you're making, we do feel like it's important for the child to know that that's a next step before that would be taken behind the students, the students' back. In terms of support for an employee that would purposefully, hypothetically, purposefully say that they're not going to follow that requirement, one of the things that was written into 496 and a number of the different statutes is the penalties for violations of some of these laws have switched. Back in the day when there were sanctions for a school district, the sanctions were about funding or something, some sort of ding to the entity itself. Under 496 and a couple of other different provisions, the penalties are to the educator themselves. And so the report of the misconduct isn't handled necessarily by myself as the deputy superintendent, our HR department, our school board. It goes directly to the Board of Education examiners. And so that's one of the things that we feel is incumbent for us to share with our employees, again, so they know the rules of the game, is that whether or not I agree personally with the decision that an educator makes, or if I tell Debbie that Debbie, I 100% support you. It might not matter if that makes sense because somebody can report Debbie to the Board of Educational Examiners and Debbie's defense of, well, the deputy superintendent told me I could do that. All that does is get me invited to pull up a chair right next to Debbie <laughs> and then both our licenses are, are, are being talked about. And so that's, that's really one of the hooks um, in the law is that the consequences are now specific to the educator um, themselves, not to the district in general. And so it, it, it ratchets up um, that the stakes not only for the students but also for our, our teachers as well. So at the risk of devolving into a, you know, a deeper legal sure. diatribe about this, um, can a teacher 
or can um, a school official um, refer a student to a li like a licensed counselor and not avoid the law or circumvent the law, but be within the confines of the law to allow the student to get some further advice or counsel without yeah. breaking the law? Yes. Now yeah. Well, I'm sorry? Right. Well, we can we can we can always re I mean we can always refer students for for outside services and the law does not say if you refer a child for outside services you have to tell the parents. The law said if they ask for a gender affirming accommodation, you had to tell the parents. The other part of that where this becomes a little bit more tricky is that we can't give misleading information to parents. And so even if a child wouldn't ask for something that was a gender affirming accommodation, if the child said they wanted to see a counselor for any reason and the parents came to us and said, hey, did you refer my child? The, the, the practitioner would have to say yes. And so you can make those referrals without um, going outside the law it's just then you can't um, lie to the parents about yeah. it. And that's a, like, and that's, I'm not hemming and hawing because I don't know the answer because I wanted to get this next point. And like, that's a really bad way to say that, right? Because I don't know an educator in the nation that doesn't want to have a good relationship with parents, right? And so like, that's one of the things also is it's not about relationships with parents. We, we see parents as crucial partners to the success of their students. And so we want to have those relationships. And, and so it's just doing it in a way to make sure that we stay on the same page, that we're keeping the parents informed, that we have this trusting relationship with them. And so, I mean, I think that's an important piece. And, and we've had those conversations, and it's, it's created a lot of questions from our staff sometime uh, about, what well, should I tell a parent this? And, and it's because of that fear factor of being referred. I'm like, Absolutely. well, would you have told them in the past? And they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, well, of course, right? Like, n nothing in the law said we don't want to be good partners anymore. And I think that's really a critical piece is that every educator, we know. We know the positive impact of having an involved parent can have positively on the education of a child. And so we all want, we all want that for our students because of that, of that critical piece it plays. It's just making sure we have that reciprocal relationship and keeping the children, the child's best interest front and center of that. Okay. I think it's time to wrap up. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramey, for your presence here and that wonderful overview reminding us of history. At one time, I was a history major, so I always appreciate the historical uh, overview. And then for um, really speaking to what Iowa City School District does best, which is I think works with children, parents, teachers, and all employees in the community. I, I was at the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council meeting Susan, on Tuesday. Sorry, the mic yeah. the mic. I was here uh, on Tuesday at the Iowa City Foreign Relations Committee meeting, and they had a guest speaker from the International Rescue um, uh, Committee. And they're talking about the chapter that's opened here in Iowa City to help incorporate bona fide refugees that have come out of United Nations refugee camps overseas to get integrated into the Iowa City community. You know what is the first place they have the parent go to? The schools. And that is key to get all the other services and all the connections, including friends, and a support system and jobs and everything else it starts with our public schools. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. A token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Another coffee mug. Yeah, I love, I, I drink coffee by the gallon, okay. so. Um, well, thank you for having me. And, and first, thank you for your support of our schools. I mean, I, it's awesome that you're here tonight and you ask such great questions and, and it makes us feel privileged and humbled to lead a school district where the community is so supportive of what we do. And so thank you for being here and for your community leadership. And, and if I can ever be of help or assistance, or you have questions of the district, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, to email me, or to call us. Uh, we love to, to work with our community partners and everyone in the community. And um, 
I know, like everyone, everyone says, we are so busy. Everybody's busy, um, uh, but we want to make sure that we provide you the information you need so that you can continue to support the great schools that we have here in Iowa City. So if I can ever be of help or assistance, please don't, don't hesitate. And just thanks so much for having me and uh, for this evening. Thank, Thank you. you. I have two other announcements, well, a couple other things I want to say, and, and two announcements. And Jean Bangroff is going, our chair of voter services. We'll tell you about the first. I'm actually going to sneak in a second one too, Susan. So um, obviously everybody here is ed interested in education and we wanted to be sure that you were aware that Saturday morning at the Iowa City Senior Center we'll be hosting a, an, a, a legislative forum. And so um, Eleanor will be there as well as other legislators and the topic is education. So we're hoping that some of you will be able to join us 9.30 a.m. Saturday morning at the Senior Center. And then the other little piece, you know, I hear people here interested in advo advocacy. The League of Women Voters does some amazing advocacy work. So join us. <laughs> and uh, we will share all, there's a, an advocacy team that uh, follows all of the bills and sends out action points, so it really helps you be able to be active without having to do all the research yourself. So, thank you. Thank you. Another announcement to make is, uh, this is the fifth, the, we'll have our fifth and final lecture for the 2023-24 education series, and that will be on Wednesday, April 17th, here in the Iowa City Public Library again, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. Connie Mutel will be our guest speaker, and she's going to challenge us to envision an action agenda for nature and agriculture in Iowa. You know, Iowa is the beautiful land. I think she's going to be talking about how to have beautiful water, too. So please come to that, and remember that this um, program will also be available on the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, Iowa's website, and also on the Iowa City Public Library's library channel for viewing immediately after the program tonight. So thank you all for coming, drive carefully, and see you hopefully in April. <laughs>